of course, you know, with all of the, uh, the media, all forms of media, whether it's national or international, or social media via, via Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, you name it, uh, there are so many different ways to communicate, <coughs> to share, and to influence uh, the events uh, in real time, in analysis, and uh, we couldn't see that uh, more in the case of Ferguson and many of the other uh, places throughout the country where we have seen uh, the relationships, and as uh, my friend Michelle Martin just discussed, uh, the relationships between uh, the police and uh, the community, the media and the community, uh, activists uh, in the community, and ways of moving forward, uh, making progress, and of course, uh, covering and uh, analyzing the nature of our racial uh, relationships in this country, uh, especially after uh, the death of uh, uh, of Michael Brown. So of course today we're going to ask ourselves a lot of questions in the conversation really uh, focusing on the, the negative and the positive ways in which we uh, share information with each other and how we can impact uh, moving forward um, the, the, uh, the racial unrest, the conflict, how do we deal with those things in real time and how do we also uh, tackle these issues that seem to be um, very, very difficult for a lot of individuals to talk about, and much less uh, our, our communities. How do we um, heal the racial divide? So I want to start off, our panelists here, uh, really very important group, and uh, we want to start off with Don Marsh. He is the host of St. Louis uh, Public Radio. He has been a journalist, amazingly so, uh, for more than 55 years in the business. Uh, television, radio, print, you name it, he's done it all. And uh, his most recent book, How to Be Rude Politely. So I, I think it's a very good skill to have. So welcome, uh, Don Marsh, who's here with us. Thank you. Uh, DeRay uh, McKesson, he is a community activist, uh, Teach for America alum, uh, previously uh, served as a senior director of human uh, capital with uh, Minneapolis uh, Public Schools. And uh, he documented the events of Ferguson uh, via Twitter, at uh, Duray is his handle. And he is founder and co-editor of the Ferguson Protester uh, newsletter. So very important voice in our discussion today. And also is um, Gilbert Bylone. He is the current editor of the St. Louis Dispatch. He has worked uh, with many, many uh, newspapers previously, uh, but in December, I attended an award ceremony. It was really just extraordinary, this award that he got in December. Uh, it was um, with the National Press Foundation. It was a Benjamin C. Bradley Editor of the Year Award uh, for his paper's coverage of Ferguson. So thank you, Gilbert, for, for joining us this morning. So I'd like to start off our first question essentially in a very simple way. Um, Don, what did the media get right and what did it get wrong in covering Ferguson? That's a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> might take a while. But it might take a while. Well, I think uh, there's quite a bit of both. I think the award that you just mentioned uh, would, uh, would signify that the Post-Dispatch did a lot right. Gilbert would probably say there are a few things they did wrong that they'd like to do over again. Uh, Dre? with his uh, Twitter feeds would probably say there's a lot that was done right with, uh, with Twitter and with social media and a lot that wasn't done right. I think with St. Louis Public Radio, we did everything right. <laughs> <laughs> with, with maybe one or two exceptions. It's so difficult to cover a story like this. I mean, my God, there's so much happening, there's so much energy, so many different dynamics. Uh, having to be in so many different places uh, at once, it's just impossible to cover in a way that is going to be complete, thorough, accurate, and impartial. And all of these factors, I think, came into play with regard to Ferguson. Uh, just let me give you some, some flash frame ideas of things that, that happened that we can talk about. One is the use of video by the television stations. Television stations uh, rely on video and they <coughs> love fires and they love the kind of action that they saw on the streets. 
there's not a whole lot of context generally to what's being done by television stations, but you get a lot of pictures. Sometimes those pictures uh, can be misleading. They can be especially misleading, I think, when people come from out of town who don't know the turf and start taking pictures and uh, thinking they have all the answers because they've got all the pictures. Uh, that, I think, created some huge problems for the Ferguson coverage in terms of, uh, of national perception. Uh, I, I'm particularly concerned about uh, the role of social media. I understand its importance, I understand its value, but I also understand that there can be uh, abuses, that there can be uh, unfiltered situations in which rumor and innuendo are set out in real time, not only around the community, but around the world. And I think uh, you know we really have to start paying attention with regard to uh, how that is used, but perhaps uh, more importantly, is how we as consumers of that, that kind of information in particular uh, react to it. And, and I think that we need to become much more media literate so that we can evaluate what we're getting on our telephones and our iPads and on our PCs at home or wherever. Uh, I think it's extremely important that we become knowledgeable consumers so that we don't perhaps take actions or say things or do things uh, that were perpetrated by false and misleading information. Uh, maybe later on, if there's time, I've got some examples of some of the things that happened in Ferguson that um, <clears throat> shouldn't have happened and, and, and uh, had the potential, I think, to make a bad situation even worse. We, we do want to get into that. And um, DeRay, I want you to pick up as well um, on the social media component and, and talk to us about whether or not you do think um, Twitter in real time, the way things had developed and the way people were reporting, um, how that impacted um, whether or not that exacer exacerbated some of the racial tension or whether or not uh, it incited some of the crowds and, and what we saw on the ground or, or whether or not there was something that was more positive that came out of that. Yeah, I would say that, you know, in no uncertain terms, Twitter saved our lives, right? Like, if, if, if it were not for Twitter, Missouri would have convinced you that we did not exist, that the unrest was actually not as intense as it was, that the police were not as aggressive and, and crazy, and I use that, I mean that, right? Like, I remember being walked to my car with a guy who had an M16 strapped across his, his chest, and I didn't do anything, right? Um, and we were able to, like, tell that story as it was happening, and people got to see many people telling the story. So if you didn't believe me, you could just see somebody else who was out in West Florida and right and if you didn't believe them you could see somebody else and that was important I think about in marginalized communities and in blackness specifically is that we have always faced this issue of erasure either our stories have not been told or people other than us have always been the people telling them and with social media it allowed us to do it we got to be the storytellers and we got to express the pain that not only we were feeling in the moment but that had been accumulating over time I will say that um, with with the coverage generally from print media I'll start there is in the beginning, it was interesting to see the way the words were used, right? So I think about the Post-Dispatch as a place where at the beginning they called the crowd a mob, right? And that means something. That like that is that is coded language about people's anger and pain, and that is racially coded, and, and they got better um, as people held them accountable. I also think about things like the Baltimore Sun. Recently, the Baltimore Sun had an article um, that was, it said like, inmate died in cell full of steam. And you're like, okay. So we click on it, and like nowhere in the article does it talk about the steam. And we're like, well, that is the story, right? Like, what, how did steam get in the cell, and, and like, how did he die there? Um, and, I, and I do think that something that got better over time was like the reporter's um, ability to ask tough questions. And I think specifically about the national media that descended on Ferguson and the local media as well, just got better at pushing back on these police narratives. Because again, when we think about the seven people that have been killed by the police in St. Louis since August, um, there's still a lot of questions. So we, we know Mike well, but you think about Von Derrick and like the police officer's um, account there, the lawyer said, you know, he was reaching for his waist. And you're like, well, and the, and the reporter rightly says, do you stop every black person who's reaching for their waist? And he's like, well, I knew the difference. And it was like important that a reporter was in the room who called him out on that. And like that got better over time. So I don't think that, to your pointed question around, do I think it exacerbated, do I think social media exacerbated the tension? I would say the tension was always present, that like people have been living in a place where they have, they have been oppressed literally and been killed literally and been fined literally for so long that what social media did is it, it brought it to the surface for people who could choose to ignore it. Um, Gilbert, go ahead and talk about the, uh, the, you know, the headline that he brought up about the, the mob and, and how the, the, uh, the coverage and 
where you were, uh, it went beyond the surface, it went beyond the immediate? Well, <clears throat> the story's really evolved. I mean, what was happening in August and what's happening now, the kinds of coverage, is very different. There was the, the initial criminal investigation, the protests, then the grand jury decision. Now what we're doing is we're spending much more time looking at what we're talking about here, the roots of a lot of these issues and how to solve these problems. And our job is to elicit the information. We, we don't do that. In the media, we do not solve problems. What we do is we provide information for people who can solve problems and attack issues. And that's what we see our role. What did we get right? I think we got most of the big stuff right. Um, were there problems with language? Yeah, we found that, that the nuance matters. Words like mobs, riot, thugs. Um, you should see to social media if you, you saw a lot of it from various angles. Um, it wasn't just the protesters who were using social, social media, it were other people. And some of it was racist, some of it was accusatory. It was not um, flattering of the media. So we, we endured a lot of that, but it was an important role. I agree with you that we use it, we continue to use it as a tool to monitor the community, what's happening in real time, the live streamers that were out there, we were following them, we got to know each other, we got to know DeRay and other people who were on the ground. So I, I think the complexity is what Don was saying is, what is the source of the information? Be literate about where it's coming from, because not everybody is media in the sense of news media. Although they're using a medium, they're using Twitter, or they're using Facebook, or they're using uh, very Instagram and other things to get their information out. It is not always the same as what we're trying to do and what we would consider ourselves the verified media. We try to get facts. We try to stick with information. Sometimes things are floating out there. Remember how some media, not us, and not a lot of local media were reporting that Darren Wilson had a broken orbital fracture. It didn't happen. He had some retinas on his face. We took a lot of flack when we, from both sides, from various sides, when we had information about what Darren Wilson testified before the grand jury, not the testimony itself, but from his lawyers, we got a lot of flack from that. We got flack when we, we got, uh, did stories about Michael Brown's uh, juvenile record, which found he did not have a, a criminal background. We pursued that in court. We were vilified by uh, Benjamin Crump and others who were on, on Michael Brown's side. Our idea was let's find the facts, and the facts actually found that he did not have a criminal background. But that was our goal was to find them, not to necessarily say he did. But when you're in, this, in, a, in a role of trying to seek information, the mere fact of seeking that information can cause heat from various angles. It's not as politically motivated as people think, because we hear about it. Read our letters to the editor. You can see that people have different views. One other thing I'll say, this is very different from any other story I've ever done. Um, I've been in the business almost 35 years. I've been doing it a long time. But what's different is people are seeing the story through different lenses. So the same story, the same photo, the same headline can elicit vastly different interpretations of the news of why did we choose that photo or why did we write that headline. Uh, and some things that we think is just seeking facts is seen as some kind of a motive to either impugn the community or impugn the police department. And what we're trying to do is we're continuing to do a lot of coverage on municipal courts, on the Ferguson Commission, all these other outgrowths of this. So I think that What's different with this story for me is it's very personal to very many people, but from very different angles. And social media does make that more real. It makes it real time and sometimes inflames some passions. I don't think that's necessarily bad, but bad information is bad because it does really uh, clutter what the discussion should be and the facts as we really know them. Don, go ahead. I just wanted to make one point spinning off of what Gilbert said with regard to the context of this story. It seems to me that the, uh, the cart kind of came before the horse in a sense that, that um, we started providing context after the fact. And we as media perhaps should have been doing more before this ever happened with regard to what was going on in North County and in some other places. Um, the social justice issues were not new. They go back right. a great many years as we all know now, but none of us was reporting on that. And I think uh, you know, that's an area where we have to do some self-analysis and try to figure out uh, you know, what's going on in some places that are of interest to us or, or, and, and really dig um, before we have a conflagration as we did in Ferguson. Go it's ahead. easier said than done, but I think we really have to think about that. Sure. And I would sort of just um, push a little bit on this idea of, of the media um, being in the fact-finding, like the verifiable sort of content is that like that is actually that is also a political act right so when we think about the victims right like when when victims when people are victimized 
there's an immediate fact finding about their lives, right? In a way that it is not about the police that killed them or the police department that allowed that to be real or in places like St. Louis, a police, a police departments that have sustained killing people, right? Like that the fact finding is often on the victim end and that actually means something, right? Like that, that is a political act in and of itself that is often racially coded. Um, so it is, it is not as easy, that, that statement sort of on the surface um, doesn't, do, doesn't do justice to the complexity and the racial coding that, that we have seen that have. So Duray, why, why the protester newsletter? What was that about? What was, what was your aim? in terms of that? Was there a need for that to be another voice? Yeah, so for context, so we started a, a, started a protester newsletter um, pretty early on, and we had about 400 subscribers at the beginning. We have about 15,000 now. Um, and it was originally, it was because when Trayvon died, I remember watching the trial and it was like, I didn't know what was true, right? Like it was all this, it was all these news stories, it was all these reports and I just didn't know what was true. So we wanted to create a space where like, if people wanted to follow the story, we would already read all the news for them and say like, read this, read this, read these things, like if you were trying to track it. So we sent it out every day and it became a source of information for us because we had to read so many, we had to read so much to like distill it down to 10 articles a day. Um, and then also it was something that was helpful for other people. So we did a counter. So, you know, we count the days. So today's the 228th day of protest. Um, we have a section with like the top tweets from the day or the day before and then pictures. Um, and now we cover the protest nationwide, but at the beginning it was primarily about Mike Brown. And what was the evolution of the coverage? Because I know we've talked about this before that there was a lot of criticism in terms of the way Ferguson was covered initially and that eventually the media started to catch up that there was more of a nuance. But in the beginning there was a real push uh, that the media had descended upon the community and was almost pushing the community to, to act in some way. Who wants to pick that up? Well, I think when we have a discussion about the media, we need to talk about who is that? Because mm -hmm. the media is a very large plural. Um, it was different when we had a lot of national, international media and the huge military presence that was you know, with, with, the, with the snipers and the trucks. That was at one point in time. But I do think that what, on a national scene, because I've been asked, what did the national media get right and wrong? I think what Don said was exact. This was a few blocks in a small suburb of, of St. Louis. And I think to the world, this became, St. Louis was burning that there was complete chaos and to some degree that's still the image unfortunately where people are seeing. I think people who live here don't see that. They see more of the complexity and the fact that it's not Ferguson, it's North St. Louis County, it's the city of St. Louis, it's regionally and it's nationally. So I, I do think that when, when we look at this uh, on a national scale, and then there are other incidents, we haven't talked a lot about that here, clearly that well, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, we've had uh, a couple shootings of Latinos in Pasco, Washington, and Grapevine, Texas, that also unarmed. So there are other issues that are that are uh, relevant elsewhere. But I think Ferguson is still seen. I think this what, what we're, why we're here today is being seen as this crucible of what were the attendant issues here? How did this? Why did it happen in Ferguson? People ask that. Why here and not other communities where there have also been police shootings? And Gilbert, do you think that the mere presence of the international and national media, the, the, the trucks, the, the, just the overwhelming presence of the media, really actually made it worse? Made it, you know, kind of fueled this kind of energy, this uh, excitement for like for violence or, or, or what was to come? Do you think the mere presence of the media? Did that. You know, I don't. Maybe Derek. He was on. The, he was on the ground, but I, I can't speak to that. I do think that it, when you do have a huge mil, uh, uh, media presence, it does create some anxiety and what some seeking of action. And people, because people were here with people, people, people with cameras in particular, want to see it, and they still were looking at that. So I, I think it ha does it fuel violence. I, I don't think so per se, but it does create it. And uh, I think it heightens anxieties. I think that uh, people are, are watching to see what's going to happen. We had a lot of people out there really late and it was, there were some dangerous situations. I do think that, uh, I wouldn't blame, we have had people, but trust me, I get, you can hear my voicemails, who are saying we, Post-Dispatch, have been stoking race relation problems, we've been encouraging looting, we're the problem, we were the creator of this, and there's some people who feel that way. I do not. I think what we were trying to do is reflect what was happening in the community, but when you see things very dramatically on television, and you see this small area in, on fire, especially after the grand jury decision, it's shocking. 
It, there's no doubt about it. But that isn't the full story of everything that's happening. I will, so I will just push a little on this. You use the language like excitement for violence. And like, I don't, I hope you weren't talking about the protest community because I don't know what that means if you were. If you're talking about the police, that makes total sense to me because they were very violent for much of the protests. I'm not specifically talking about either group. I'm just talking about the sense of um, the fact that some people felt like just the mere, um, kind of the drumming, the drumming up of what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next was almost like kind of baiting people to do something that was more um, active and, and more controversial than, than they would have. I, you know, it is this thing about like the trauma was always present. What, what social media and what, and what the, the national and local media did was sort of bring the trauma um, to the surface for people who could choose to ignore it before, and it united people who like didn't realize that other people were experiencing the pain the same way they were, right? So I, I do think that that's real. I don't, I wouldn't put that in this bucket of sort of like baiting people because I would say the police are baiting people by killing people, right? Like the reason that we, we don't protest because it's like exciting and really fun to do, right? Like we protest because, because like the police are literally still killing people. Um, and that is like why people are still in the streets because again, in this context, the police have killed seven people. So when we think about this issue of like it is Ferguson being like a smaller place and, and sort of media sort of um, using Ferguson to paint a broad picture about St. Louis, what we would say is that like the police did the broad picture about St. Louis, right? By killing like Mike, Kajim, Von Derrick, Thomas, Ladarius, Antonio. Um, that like that they act, that people have been killed all over the region. That it is it started in Ferguson, but the story is actually a regional story because the pain is regional, and that it it has been so embedded for so long, and it's coming to the surface. So I don't think that it soaked the flame. I do think, and what I will say in the in to be fair is that I do think there is this thing about credibility with social media, right? That like we can push out. You know, I think about I had less than nine hundred followers in August. I have seventy four thousand, right? So if I push out the wrong information, it means something different because people believe that I'm more likely than not going to tell the truth, right? If they can determine that it's the wrong information. Right. No, and if I, and, right. So if I say like, oh, this thing just happened and then it didn't, like that is a problem, right? And like, because we can do it so quickly, that does create like a different sort of context to be in. I think about recently with um, Jackson's resignation, it was this thing where like, we're sitting waiting for Christine Byers, which is one of his reporters. And like, if Christine didn't say it, it's not real to us, right? Because she has all the scoop on the police. But you know, and we were really conscious about not retweeting or talking about like anything about it until Christine said something because like we knew she would know the actual answer and like we have we have gotten better at like negotiating the space of like we we know people trust us so how do we like use that I think about Martise Johnson is another great example like uh, people tweeted me and Sean King as they tweeted like ABC and, and CNN about Martise and like you know the initial picture is were so like I didn't know if it was real so I didn't retweet them because I didn't want to be like somebody stoking the fire if it wasn't a fire right they're stoking the flames um, so I like found a kid's tweets who looked like it was real like she looked like she knew Martise and I like DM'd her and was like give me a call so I get on the phone with her and I'm like can you just tell me this happened and she was like it totally happened so I get off the phone I call I call UVA's off the president's office and I'm like is there a statement about Martise and she's like they're like no and then they transfer me to communications and they're like we don't know anything about Martise and then like I text somebody else who's a protester we put up call the president's office it gets retweeted 1600 times and we like helped bring this energy and like we're not there right so like CNN's calling me and like USA Today is calling me and it's like I don't know I'm like not at UVA don't know don't know any of the students really but I do want you to look at this right and like we've tried to use the platform to do that because again we would say that like we just want to tell the truth and the truth is so damning that it actually should radicalize people it should make people uncomfortable so we've heard a, a real example of reporting Don pick up on that if you will because you had it said before that a lot of people don't really make the distinction between credible sources what are not credible sources and what's just out there well a lot of people will assume that a source is credible simply because it's a network commentator for instance pardon me Suzanne but that I think the cable networks did uh, pretty much a, a disservice to Ferguson uh, they didn't want that story to die I don't think uh, they were particularly helpful and in, in some cases to the people who were protesting and who did have a specific uh, point that they wanted to make or points that they wanted to make, uh, they've got to pull back a little bit. They're so competitive. Um, I, I think Lawrence O'Donnell uh, drove me nuts 
uh, with his desire to make a story that would fit what he thought the story was rather than what the story actually was. He kept trying to draw people into his version of what, uh, of what he thought took place. He wasn't there. Uh, and it was very bothersome to see headlines saying Missouri in a state of emergency when what we were talking about was not Missouri in a state of emergency, but a, a, just a segment of Missouri that had been uh, declared an emergency area. That was true, but it's misleading, it's mi misrepresentative, and I think that the competitive tone that is sent on, uh, set on that national level, and in some cases the local level as well, can be very damaging. It's very, it distorts to a very large degree what is actually going on, and not interested in what the issues really are, what Dre is talking about. We're almost talking about two different things here with regard to what uh, the points that he wants to make and what he thinks are important, what are important to the community and what they feel has to change as opposed to what people like Lawrence O'Donnell and O'Reilly and some of the others uh, you, you know, want to present as within their own particular agenda, if I can put it that way, and I think they do have an agenda. So, Don, if I could, um, how did the national, on the national stage, the national platform, you have various actors uh, who perhaps have agendas, who uh, perhaps are there for different reasons. How do you turn that, how you twist that and use that uh, for something that would move this forward in a way that when we talk about racial healing or understanding, well, is, there, is there a way that that national platform can be used in a more positive uh, uh, way? Absolutely, if they started talking about racial heal hearing, healing as opposed to some of the more dramatic things that are seen in the, uh, in the uh, video that they, they bring to bear. You know, the, the video itself, it, we need it, we, we watch it. It's an important part of television, for instance. But video in and of itself can incite turn that camera on and turn a light on and things are going to happen and, uh, and in some cases not happen. I mean you can point a camera at a cop who's getting ready to hit somebody over the head, that light comes on, they're not going to do it. On the other hand, if you've got people who've come in from out of town, and there were out of towners that have come in and are still here, uh, and put the camera on them, they're going to perform for the camera. I mean, We have to show some restraint ourselves. Uh, and I think for the most part that happens, but I think we really have to work on that, particularly with something as dramatic as Ferguson. And uh, again, the, 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 two, the two cable networks in particular, Fox and MSNBC, I think wanted this story to last forever and uh, helped perpetuate it uh, as long as it uh, lasted. I wonder if any of the panelists here could talk about the responsibility, if, if they feel there's a responsibility for individuals. We have so many different um, choices to make when it comes to where we get our news, how we get our news, how we communicate with each other. And it's, it's very compelling uh, to, to turn on to see the visual pictures and uh, the competition, of course, among the, the networks uh, to put those the most compelling uh, pictures for people to watch. But then you also have Twitter, the immediacy of Twitter, and the, the real deep dives, the analysis of print. Uh, what is the responsibility of those who really want to understand to have a, a, a full plate, a full diet, a diverse diet, if you will, of, of how to get their information and how to learn about what took place. I will say, so I'll push a little bit on this idea, Don, of um, highlight the healing, right? Like I think that there's something that happens in marginalized communities where we there's this, like this rush to heal without actually acknowledging the wound and the trauma and i do think that like the reality is that this is that the wound and the trauma is so deep that like so i'm not upset when he calls it a state of, a state of emergency in missouri because it felt like one it felt like anywhere i went there was a humvee whether it was in north county or not or in in St. Charles, anywhere, it felt like it felt like the police were everywhere at that time, and it felt like if I did something, like I don't know why there's a state of emergency, and like we haven't, we legitimately have not done anything yet. So like I'm not worried about those sort of things, and I do think there is, I, and I say that in the context, I do think some people are still. I think some people want to make things look wild that might not be wild, but what I will say is that there is enough wildness out there that they could do that all day, and that's also true, right? That there, that the trauma and blackness is so real and so present, uh, not only around police brutality, but a host of other issues that if, if people were actually telling that story, that would be important too. And I do think that there's this thing that happens with marginalized people that's like, please heal, right? Don't be angry anymore. We don't want the angry black people. We want them out of the street. Like, it's this idea that like, we want to control the people's response to the pain that actually bothers me. And it's why the protests haven't ended, right? Is that like, 
we know that the resignations and all this other stuff, they are both good, they are necessary, and none of it is justice, right? Like if justice is never experiencing the trauma or accountability for those who perpetuate and initiate the trauma, we don't have that yet. And I, and I worry that people might, um, people want us to push past the pain and get to healing when nobody's actually acknowledged the trauma. And I would say Missouri is a phenomenal example of like not acknowledging the trauma. And I'll repeat it over and over that like seven people have been killed in this, in, in this region since August. And that is unlike any other place in America, right? Like that is, that is real, that is deep. And we have one closed investigation. I was there the night of the shooting when the, when the guy shot the police officers. Um, and like that investigation was over in like 48 hours. I mean, over, like they were like, got them, like, you know, hidden camera confession, like, you know, the documents are leaked. And that is crazy to me. And that is wild. Like it, Von Derek, uh, Kajim got killed like nine days after Mike Brown. And there is, we legitimately don't know anything. Like that's crazy to me. Gilbert, do you want to weigh in? <clears throat> well, I think the media have tremendous responsibility for this reason. Most people in this area have not gone to Ferguson, haven't been at a protest. Don't, what they're seeing, their world is being created through various forms of media. And that's an important responsibility for us. Um, we take that very keenly, that we know that this is an important issue, issues that fo people form opinions about. They form opinions about other people. They form opinions about where they're gonna go, where they're gonna live, how they vote, all these things. What we're trying to do is put the information out that's of high quality and responsibly. But we'll take the example you just brought up with the police officers who were shot um, uh, from, the, from the crowd, somewhere behind the crowd uh, recently. We don't really know all the details, yet we in the media are asking the questions. The police are saying it was uh, directed at the police, they were saying that he was embedded in the crowd. The protesters say it wasn't us. We don't know who this person was. And his lawyer is saying he was physically abused by the police. What I'm trying to convey to you is I don't know the truth of all that, and we often don't, and we didn't at the initial time. What we try to do is get information most authoritatively as we can and report it. But it's not CSI. We can't tell you that there's always going to be evidence that's going to make things clear. The DOJ report pointed out a lot of conflicting information that was, we were given and we had reported in the paper based on good sourcing, but it turned out some of those things weren't right. So we can't be perfect, but what we can be is responsible and try to source and put the information out to the best of our knowledge and talk to as many people as we can from different viewpoints. All right, that wanna, is our responsibility. I want to open up for questions and answers here, Q&A uh, from our audience. If you uh, come to the mics, does anybody have some questions? We'd be happy to take some questions. Uh, this is for uh, Gilbert. I, I think that the coverage of the Post, at least on the fact, fact digging uh, about municipal courts and um, some of those issues were, was incredible. And on the front page, big charts by community uh, was very helpful. And I know there's many more inequities in the system that we as citizens don't have um, don't even know what sometimes the questions to ask. We're learning, and the paper helped us ask some of those questions. I would encourage you to continue to dig into those stories about insurance redlining, about housing, all of these things. We need to keep them in front of us as much as you can be our conscience. And I would say the same thing to DeRay, that you know, as much as you can keep us focused on these issues so that we can all, we don't, it doesn't go under the covers, it doesn't get clouded, and we can really look at some of these problems. We all can't solve all of them, but each of us has an interest and a, and a place in the community, and maybe with the proper information um, factually presented from the, from the details that exist in Jeff City or wherever they exist, uh, we can we can get behind it because it, it was presented in a factual, in-your-face way, and I appreciated you doing that. But I wouldn't stop. There's more to more for us to know. Well, we are we are not going to stop. Um, and I think that as I, I think I mentioned, the story really has evolved from the actual shooting, the, the criminal investigation, the protest into what we're talking about today. It is municipal courts. It's unaccredited school districts. It is poverty. It is policing in North St. Louis County. It is the fact that there's heavily, uh, most of the subsidized housing in the county is concentrated in a limited area. It's about diversity in police departments. We're gonna continue to delve into all those things. And again, our role in the media is to bring it to the forefront. But it will be other people who will really make the actions happen. 
who will form the commissions, pass the laws, pass reforms. We also, I want to mention, I hope you read our editorial page, those of you who are from this area, because we've been very vocal about reforms that we are advocating very strongly, some of which happen. What, going way back when, we said a commission should be formed. The Ferguson Commission was reformed. The Supreme Court has weighed in on municipal court reform. I think there's going to be, there already been some changes. I think there will be more. So again, that sometimes doesn't get the headlines of when we say about the media, but that voice, but also the voice on the op-ed page of people from the community who are writing letters, posting on our website. We're trying to engage the entire community. That's a very important role. It's not that everybody's going to agree, but to have that dialogue in a, in a more profound way than we've had before. I, I, wonder, I wonder if I can just add this. I wonder where we would be right now in terms of right at this moment or where we have been in the last weeks in this community if it weren't for the demonstrations, if it weren't for the continued presence of largely young people in the streets keeping the drum beating for our attention to make something happen and to affect change. I kind of think it would be like so many of the things we've gone through in the past, not only the past months, but past years, where an incident happens and there is this call for conversations and then there are a couple of conversations and then they dissipate until the next incident occurs. What I see in the value of what Dre and his friends and colleagues are doing and others are doing in the demonstrations is keeping that drum beating. And as long as they do that, I think you're going to see more op-ed pieces and more editorials. You're going to hear more broadcasting from us. The TV stations might get into uh, some of the context of what's going on in the community. I think it's terrifically important what they're doing. And if this is to be sustained and if change is going to be affected, it's going to be people like this young man right here uh, keeping at it, keeping that energy at the high level they've maintained since August 9th. And I'll just say very briefly that the post-dispatch coverage, and I said this to him before, has gotten much better than it was. Um, and I do think that they've taken some risks. Like, I, I can think about some editorials that came out that I was like, is that the post-dispatch? Like, <laughs> they did that? Like, what is, I'm like, what just happened? Um, so that is, that's real. I also think that, I, you know, this, all of Ferguson and the coverage renewed my faith in print reporters. Like, I am, um, I think about the print reporters uh, that were here. There was like a, a call that Nixon had. It was like a conference call on the phone. He had just like done something. <laughs> ridiculous and it was like it was a conference call press conference and the reporters on that call were just like I mean it was they were phenomenal and it's the all it's the sad thing about the McCullough press conference tonight of the no indictment is that it was all of the um, whatever you call the like in-person report it, the print people weren't in the room and the questions were awful like it, I like I just sat watching on TV waiting for like the Washington Post print people and like the post like the print reporters have just been really strong and I do think the DOJ report around the Ferguson Police Department provided cover for a lot of the newspapers that stood with us in August and sort of got slammed for being biased. And then a report came out and it was like, no, no, they really were telling the truth. And I've seen the coverage nationally change since uh, the Ferguson report came out. Like I, I, and I will just publicly, they got some work to do, but it got better. How about public radio reporters? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've done a pretty good job. You too. have, you have, you have, <laughs> yes, you have. <laughs> you have. And uh, we're going to take another question. I think it's thank, important to also you. note that uh, you know the governor, as well as many of the, uh, the the governor's commission and many other people, who are involved in uh, the discussion about racial healing and moving forward. So, sir, go ahead. The governor. Um, <laughs> the governor. Um, let me go on to another topic. I wanted to thank all of you, and I, that press conference that the governor was at that was recorded was very informative and enlightening about our governor, uh, without saying anything more about that. If you haven't heard it, you should hear it. Um, thank you all for all your work at all levels, and the infographics in the paper, the work that you're doing at KWMU, phenomenal, the people. I've been to the events you've held with Michelle Martin, phenomenal, and your work also. There's a question that's not being asked, however. It's the question of our chief law enforcement officer in St. Louis County. And I think we need to be asking our chief law enforcement officer, I'm not a lawyer, about the law and why he's not taking an active role in enforcing the law when we have police departments that are breaking the law. 
on a regular basis. And it's really scandalous from my perspective. We have a mentee who's experienced it firsthand, and it just should not be tolerated in our community. And you guys have an opportunity to ask Mr. McCullough about this. Walter Isaacson gave us a great charge. We have a great opportunity in the community, and I hope we rise to the occasion. So thanks for all your work. Keep up the great work. What, what I'd say back to you is that, like, especially in a, in a context like this, is this idea that, um, that there are white people who have a ton of privilege who can use that privilege to disrupt in incredible ways. And there's like space for that to happen too. So I, I do think that like we have a responsibility to continue to tell this story, but there are people who stand in, who say they stand in solidarity with, with what is happening that need to like to actually stand in solidarity, right? They need to say like, this won't happen on my watch and I'll use my privilege in ways that can disrupt and ways that I as a black man cannot. Like, and that has to be a part of the conversation too. So I think it is, I think it is, uh, it, some people have joined us in protest. I think when we like sat in at the, when we like occupied this, uh, the Metro Police Department here, like if 20 black people had walked in, they would have been like, no, 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 no. But 20 white people got in like, you know, filling out paperwork before we shut it down and like that was important. But I also think it's like going to the, the city council meetings and county council and like using the, the, the networks that you have to like, to get into spaces and have conversations that people like me, people protesting, we just won't get close enough to it, right? So they know my vest. When I'm anywhere now, it's like, I just can't, like it's hard, right? For the protesters to get in some spaces, but there are people who have privilege and access and resources that can like ask questions and can push conversations. And when we think about protests, right? Protest is disruption and confrontation. It is not always physical. Mo some of it is like changing the way people think about the world. And that will, we will not win alone, right? We know that we won't win with just black people being awakened. Like it'll take the majority culture. It'll take white people also like understanding this is their problem too and like fighting against injustice in whatever way they can. Go ahead. Hi, I wanted to see if you all could speak a little bit to, um, I'll make a statement first. It seemed to me early on um, in the first couple of weeks, every time I opened, every time I turned on the television, particularly when I was traveling, that I saw someone from our local African American Weekly uh, on national news framing for the national media what was happening here. It is not lost on me that the National Newspaper Publishers Association has named our African American Weekly the top paper for the majority of the last <coughs> decade to dozen years. Uh, and there are some partnerships with the Huffington Post having a fellow embedded there with them now uh, and with uh, St. Louis Public Radio. So I wanted to see if you all would talk about uh, what the potential difference would be to this narrative if we in St. Louis did not have the number one black paper in the country uh, and the place of advocacy journalism uh, and the role of African American newspapers uh, in movements for social justice and social change in our community, uh, particularly noting the lack of equity uh, in many mainstream public media um, outlets um, that would we be having this conversation if we didn't have a strong African American weekly here? How have you all partnered with them uh, and how important is that to getting the narrative right, particularly as it relates to African-American people? Well, it's a question of reach. You certainly want to reach into all parts of the community. Um, maybe it should be an African-American daily. You know, uh, that, that comes to mind, and I know how difficult that is to do, but certainly it's important to, uh, that everyone in the community have access to accurate information. And, yeah, the uh, St. Louis American is certainly doing a job in that regard. Um, I, I think it's very important to have uh, an African American paper here of the strength before Ferguson. I mean, this has been a long standing newspaper here. We know the people there. In fact, we're meeting with them this week. They're coming to visit with us. I think post Ferguson, they've been critical of the Post Dispatch. There's, there, I mean, and that's fine. We, we, we probably need some criticism. But we're also looking at this as an opportunity of more of a community issue. What are we missing at the Post-Dispatch? What are they bringing to the table? We have more resources in some ways. At the same time, we reach a bigger audience. They reach an important audience. I do think, I really wish more people outside the African-American community read the St. Louis American and other ethnic media. I used to, I was a Spanish language uh, editor in Dallas before I came here. And I would say the same thing because it is a different perspective. Um, it is not always the same perspective, but it is different. 
And I think having that, for us, we read them all the time. We look at them online, we follow them on Twitter. They're an important part as I think they do us. So I think more people who are trying to do this type of, uh, not just opinion based, but also fact based, it, it, the more voices that are heard. I would encourage the mainstream society to pay attention to the St. Louis American and other ethnic media in this area because they're representing something that's very different. It's not always completely different, but there are, there's information in there that we can't cover everything. We, we in the mainstream media, that's including radio and television, there are things that we will miss because their focus is entirely on the African American community. Because so, we're running out of time here, it's going to be our last question really quickly sure. if we can wrap it up. Um, and actually, um, Reverend Wilson kind of touched a little bit on my question, so thank you for being there. Um, I'll say first to you, D. Ray, I was both um, informed and annoyed a little bit early on with you know a lot of your posts and things like that, but I will um, concur with your comment about the role of social media and Twitter, because that's how I found out you know, about it and, you know, popped right on and that was immediately the picture that went up. And so I think there was a very critical role that social media and now social media journalists, if you would, I'm going to maybe use that term a little loosely played. But there were a couple um, comments I want to make and maybe this is a question or not. I looked around the room and I noticed that Wiley isn't here. And I'm noticing that a lot of the photographers or photojournalists are of the mainstream. I also noticed on the panel that there isn't anyone of media, if we're talking about media and Ferguson reporting, that the St. Louis American um, is not representative. Um, not represented here, and I'm wondering if we're again missing an opportunity because if you dial back to the civil rights movement of 50 years ago, it was the black media or African American media, if you will, that told the stories that the mainstream media was maybe presenting from a police point of view or from some of the coded languages that you referred to before, um, D. Ray. So just kind of a question about that, and I'll concur maybe a little bit what y'all said with the challenge of actually reading and you know maybe have a dual view. So the Post-Dispatch, your coverage has gotten better. I'll agree with D. Ray on that. It was a little biased um, in the beginning. And then the comments are deplorable. I've returned to St. Louis for eight years, and it is a racially divided community. And that's represented in the media here, both print and television. And so it's just not lost on me that the St. Louis American is not on this panel. Thank you. Does anybody want to pick up? Yeah, I would quickly say that I, what was important about the St. Louis American is that they, their reporters and their photographer, they just like understood the pain immediately. Like it wasn't, like I do think some of the mainstream reporters had to like, you know, peel back, like, why are you upset? And, and you're like, what do you mean? Why are we, like, it was something that like the, the St. Louis American, they just understood the trauma and pain and, and how deep it was. And that just, that made sense. I do think in terms of who was telling the story and I'm biased, obviously, I do think that like social media was actually telling the most full story, like the most consistent. Consistently, and I and I do think that there were many instances where uh, mainstream media had to respond to just the the noise that social media was making around some issues. I think about you know I talked to Gilbert about the one thing that I'm still upset with them about um, is when the Mike Brown Memorial got trashed one night in Officer Zoll at the Ferguson PD. He like lied about it to a, a media outlet, and like their coverage minimized the fact that a Ferguson police officer is still lying like a hundred days later, right? But like it was because we tweeted it at three o'clock in the morning that anybody even knew that it happened, right? Like no reporter was there, and I do think social media social media was like the the thing and continues to be the thing that like keeps the flame going alongside the physical protests. You know, one thing I'd like to say is that um, I think there's a misperception of the Post Dispatch as kind of being the, the white media. When I look around our newsroom and I see Koran Ado, who's African American, who was uh, pepper sprayed in front of the police department at a protest with a number of other people, we, our news editor is African American, Ron Wade, who's the guy in charge at night. He's the one who decides the front page and the headlines and oversees all that operation. He's African American. Our video editor, Gary Helson, African American. Christian Gooden, African American photographer. We have Hispanic photographers. We have women photographers. So sometimes I think the idea that we're coming at it with, we make mistakes. Coming out every day and now we come out every second virtually with social media and, and our website that we will make mistakes. But I, I do think you need to think a little deeper that well, while we make mistakes, it may not be the, the, the reasons that we have. And we have much more diversity. We need more. I'll tell you that right now. I don't know of a metro editor, newspaper editor in the country who say, yeah, I have enough diversity. That's not, that's not, or a police department will say the same. That's not the case. 
but I do, I, do, I do push back to say somehow that we're all thinking alike and in league is not true. And I will encourage you to read the editorial page because it's very forceful. We've won some national awards from some of the things because we will continue to be fighting that fight. And I think that's an important role. The media that is different from some other, television doesn't really have that platform. They have some opinion. But I think it's an important part being part of the local media because we live here. We're, li we're experiencing this. We have people who live in Ferguson. We have people who live in North County. We have folks who, this is a personal story for them. And I think that in, informs us better than somebody who may just come here for a couple weeks and do a story. And it is very personal to us. Don, last word here very quickly. Yeah, don't criticize the panel for being here. We didn't in invite ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, uh, we appreciate. I have, we can I say one other thing. All right. We appreciate <laughs> you being here. There's one other point I'd like to make. Um, I'm not sure of the year because I keep hearing different years, but, but anywhere between 2026 and 2040, white America is going to be the largest minority in this country. So. Watch out, white America. All <laughs> right. Watch out. On that, on that note, thank you very much, all three of you, for joining thank us. You. We appreciate a very provocative thank you, and conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the rest of the panel. Thank you very much. We got a number of uh, also action items out of that, I think. Uh, though some are familiar in the, in the media area of you know, covering stories before they uh, explode, the getting into that community, the underserved communities, and the importance of media literacy, which you started off with, is obviously one that we, we need to do more and more of. Um, so thank you for that panel, and I think we'll, uh, we'll excuse you and move on to the next one. Uh, while we do that, I will take... <laughs> I will take the blame on the not having the American uh, editor. It, w it, it was an oversight on our part, and we, uh, I, you know, are seeing that that was a that was a mistake. We don't. We also don't have uh, any of the mainstream uh, television stations. Uh, that was not. We just had to limit how many people we would have. So, uh, but but the not having the American uh, editor was is is my fault. Um,